Uh, all right, so let's move on with our next speaker, who is uh, Laszlo Nagy, Nagy from the Biological Research Center of Hungary, who is going to talk about resolving recalcitrant fungal relationships. Are our best models good enough? Thank you, Laszlo. Hey, thank you, Rosa, and uh, thanks, Jesus. Can you hear me? Awesome. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, just one second. I need to find the right screen to share. Okay. Um, thank you very much for organizing this conference. It's uh, really nice. It's really very refreshing to have some so, some discussion on science in this this otherwise, you know, um, conference poor period, um, unfortunately. And I never thought my biggest audience so far in my life would be virtual. Um, so that makes it particularly interesting and exciting. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about some recalcitrant fungal relationships. Um, I'm going to start with a, a schematic tree of life of the fungi and, and by saying that fortunately the fungal tree of life is pretty well resolved. Um, there are a number of exceptions uh, from that, of course. Um, but in general, our knowledge on the fungal tree has, has advanced significantly in the last uh, few years or decades, uh, owing to in a large extent to um, phylogenomic approaches and the, and the easy access to genome scale, to genome sequencing in fungi, because fungal genomes are pretty small, so it's, it's relatively easy to sequence and assemble them. So fortunately, we have a large number of really high quality uh, genome sequences in fungi. Um, so I mentioned there are a few exceptions uh, from this well resolution of the fungal tree of life. Um, one of them is our, our current study system, which you can see uh, up on the top of this tree. It's the Basidiomycota, the mushroom forming fungi, um, which is traditionally uh, hard to resolve uh, uh, clade of fungi. Um, so this group contains um, three subphyla, which I'm going to just simplify here. Um, it contains the agarix, uh, the agaricomycotina. It contains the eustelogenomycotina, which I'm going to call uh, smuts. These are plant parasitic fungi that uh, are maybe best known from the, the model organism Ustilago, which is called smut. Um, and the third subphylum is the Puccinium mycotina, which also contains predominantly plant parasites and a number of saprobes. Uh, I'm, ju I'm just gonna call them rusts for, for simplicity um, in this talk. So, so this, is a, this, this has been a, a node that has seen all possible versions of resolution in various uh, trees that have been published throughout the years. Um, at the bottom of the slide, I show some of the genome scale phylogenies that have supported uh, all three possible um, conformations of the tree around this node. I should uh, stress at this point that the most common conformations are the first two on the bottom part of this slide. Um, the first is uh, agarix grouped with uh, smuts, the Euslegia mycotina, and agarix grouped with um, with rust fungi. So to tackle these relationships, um, we chose uh, a genome scale approach. Um, we chose 67 genomes. Um, we increased the sampling of, of rust and smart species significantly. In most of the previous genome scale phylogenies, there were up to two or three uh, rust and smart species, which may be you know, it, it might have led to, to biases in how we can resolve the relationships among these subphyla. So we wanted to increase uh, the sampling, and that's that's predominantly um, um, possible due to work of Caddy Aim at Purdue University and the Joint Genome Institute. The JGI is always uh, has always been a, a great partner for fungal biologists and sequencing fungal genomes. Um, so that's that's part of. Uh, why we could do this project. We opted for a protein sequence based uh, concatenation and, uh, and, uh, and summary method 
uh, approach and we selected our phylogenetic markers uh, based on a gene tree aware uh, strategy. So basically we were inspecting each of the gene trees um, for terminal versus deep duplications. And if there are only terminal duplications or no duplications in a gene family, we accepted those as, as potentially good markers, whereas if there were um, if there were deep paralogues, then we rejected those gene family because it can cause uh, problems in inferring the right um, gene topology, uh, gene tree topology. So we assembled uh, four data sets in the order of um, de decreasing order of gene uh, data set size. We started with a data set which, in which we just concatenated all the genes. Um, there were 950 genes. We concatenated them into a data set of uh, 700,000 uh, amino acids. Then we applied increasingly stricter um, filtering approaches or filters in G blocks. Uh, the first is called a relaxed, uh, where we allowed gaps. This resulted in a 241,000 amino acid uh, data set. And then, and then we, we applied more and more uh, stringent filters. The most uh, stringent one ended up having uh, 300 genes, 314 genes, and around 46,000 uh, characters. Now, the, in the first place, what we observed is that there were conflicts uh, between the maximum likelihood trees uh, that we could infer for these, these data sets. Three of the data sets supported SMATs and AGARIX uh, as a monophyletic group to the exclusion of RUSTs, whereas the most, the, the smallest data set, which is, which is at the same time the most conserved one, uh, supported the grouping of rusts and, and uh, agarics. Uh, these, these are the trees uh, that show the, the entire phylogeny. You can see that the agarics are the best uh, sampled subphylum. And then on this uh, 314 gene uh, data set, the rusts are grouping with agaricomycetes, and then smuts are branching um, uh, third from this tree. The other two data sets I'm showing here. And the two, the four, three, four are the 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 what we, what we call the semi-relaxed data set. It has uh, 800 genes, and the relaxed data set, which has around 900 genes. These two data sets supported SMATs as the sister group to Agarix with strong support. Now, what we were interested in is what could be causing this uh, this uh, contradiction. Um, so we first just plotted the, the bootstrap support for a given topology uh, as a function of data set size. And what we see is that that support for the, for the, for the smart plus agarix grouping increases as the size of the data set increases. Um, so this, this kind of made us curious um, what, what could be underlying um, this, uh, this phenomenon, especially if you take into consideration the, 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 the conservation of the data sets. The smallest data set, the 314 gene data set is the most conserved, whereas the other two larger data sets are less conserved. So we, we, we kind of started to suspect that, that there might be, um, you know, some kind of biases, some kind of processes that we can't model um, going on in the data set, which might be leading to the very high support values that we see in the two larger data sets. So uh, we have come up with a few biological uh, hypotheses and a few technical hypotheses that could potentially explain the uncertainty. So the first thing we thought of is, is, is it possible that there's just no signal in these data sets uh, for this particular node in the tree? And is it possible that, that we are just seeing you know, arbitrary groupings of the, of the taxa? We also consider the hard polytomy, um, in which case the three subphyla would have been diverging virtually uh, um, simultaneously during evolution. And because of that, we expect no signal, no biological, um, biologically relevant um, substitutions to have accumulated in those uh, in those lineages. We also considered incomplete lineage sorting. And on the technical sides of uh, things, 
we were our, our thinking was revolving around uh, model misspecification, the impact of fast evolving sites, um, potentially long branch attraction, and a number of other um, um, sources of of, uh, of uh, bias and conflict. So first we we looked at um, the signal in the data sets, and we find that the, the data sets contain um, strong signal for, this, for, for, for these uh, splits. You can see on the bottom right uh, figure in the, in, uh, on the slide that the likelihood mapping uh, analysis suggests that most of the sites, the vast majority of the sites are located around the angles of this triangle. So that suggests that the sites are actually uh, having signal for resolving the tree, because if there was no signal, then we would expect the sites to be and the, and the splits to be in the middle part of the of the triangle. Um, we also run uh, Bayesian analysis that allowed uh, polytomic trees to be visited during the MCMC. This is this is implemented in FICAS. Uh, this analysis suggested even under polytomy friendly uh, priors that the data set has a strong signal for dichotomous relationships and dichotomous topologies. So with that, we could pretty confidently reject the hypothesis that this, uh, uh, this difficulty of resolving the tree would be stemming from a hard polytomy. Um, next, we asked what happens if we remove fast evolving sites? Fast evolving sites can be a source of, uh, of various uh, technical problems, uh, modeling problems, uh, biases, long range attraction, and so on. So we arranged uh, the data sets, the size of the data sets into eight categories and started reducing the size of the data set by removing the fastest, then the, sec the two second, the two fastest uh, rate categories, and so on. Um, on the right hand side of the slide, you can see the results for two data sets. Um, as we start removing uh, fast evolving sites from the data sets, support for the grouping of agarics and smuts decreases. This is the solid line, whereas support for the grouping of agarics and rusts increases. This is the dash line. So this is this is this is very interesting. Um, and especially if we compare it to an analysis where we randomly removed uh, sites from the data set. And in, in that case, there was basically no change in the support values, whatever. So what we see this decrease is not because we are, we are removing sites, um, you know, that are conferring signal to these splits. It is because the, the removal indeed changes the proportion of, uh, of a signal that comes from the data set. Um, so this tells us that there is something going on with, with fast evolving sites. And then we were thinking uh, if fast evolving sites are, are causing a problem potentially, then we could also examine this phenomenon from a different angle, from the model's angle. Because fast, fast evolving sites are hard to, to model usually, we, we started looking at uh, models of, of different complexity levels. So by changing the complexity level of the model, we can, we can emulate the impact of, you know, emulate basically increasing or decreasing bias in the data sets. One minute. So on this, on this figure, um, and we, we show the, how the topology and how the support values change uh, by, by changing the complexity of the model. Um, we start with a topology that unites rusts with mushroom forming fungi, the agarics. And wherever you see a, a yellow dot, uh, the topology flips there. Uh, now upwards uh, on this figure, we have simpler models. Um, lower, on the lower side, we have more complex models. You can see that in both sides, um, um, the topology flips from the Rust plus agaric topology to the Smart plus agaric topology, especially in the case of uh, simple models. So from this, we conclude that simple models favor um, the, the Smart plus agaric uh, grouping. And maybe 
this this is this is stemming from from model violation. Um, we did a complementary analysis for this. This was basically done by Vincent Doyle at LSU. Uh, this is a Bayesian posterior predictive approach that that tells us how well best fit models are fitting the data. Um, what we saw in this in this analysis is that it was this was surprising actually that even the best fit models that we selected uh, can be rejected confidently uh, compared to to you know ba based on based on posterior predictive distributions. So this tells us that even the best fit models are fitting the data pretty poorly. This was a surprising um, observation. So to, to summarize uh, my talk, um, in the basal basidio mycota relationships, uh, we saw robust incongruence rather than robust support, as, as it is usually the case with, with, um, with uh, genome scale phylogenies, phylogenies. We suspect that model violation underlies the uncertainty of, of uh, resolving basal basidio mycota relationships. We have two kinds of evidence for that. Um, and we also saw that the best fit models still re represent a pretty poor fit for each of the partitions in our data. This was probably the most surprising relation, uh, finding in our data, in our study, sorry. Um, I, should, I should stress that most of these analyses were performed in 2015 and 16 when, uh, when some of the more complex models that are now available in IQT, for example, were not published yet. So maybe if, if we were to use those, um, we, could, we could get some more definitive um, answers for these questions. Um, on the biological side of, of uh, things, basal basidio mycota relationships remain unresolved, which is not satisfactory as a final biologist, uh, but I think, I think it tells us a lot about, um, about how, how we should really treat uh, phylogenomic data sets and what are the kinds of biases that we should face when we are analyzing these kinds of data. Okay, with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, thank you very much for the uh, attention. Thanks for all the uh, collaborators and the funding, and thanks for the attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, thank you very much, Adlo, for your, for your talk. Uh, we go straight to the questions. Uh, the first one is by Christian Riquelme. It is possible to incorporate ecological data or other sources of information like geometric morphometrics to solve the uncertainty of phylogenetic relationships? Yes, that would be, that, that's a fantastic idea. Um, we looked at the morphologies and the, and the phenotypes that could actually support or, or, or reject either of the topologies uh, that we had. And we find that even at the level of the phenotypes, there is a lot of homoplasy. Um, so two classic um, traits that have been used to unite uh, smart with agarics are poor septal structures and spindle pole body um, morphologies and other structures. But we also found uh, phenotypic traits that unite rusts with, with, with agarics. So either way, there is homoplasy. In the, in, in the morphologies. So I think it would be pretty, pretty hard to, to find really good traits that can support a phylogenetic inference. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm not seeing a question at the moment. So maybe, uh, I don't know, unless someone asks something, I, I think it would be better to move on. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Laszlo. It was a, a great talk. Uh, let's 